For Mark Zuckerberg naming his children after the Roman emperors Maximus, Augustus, and Aurelia, to Elon Musk wanting to fight in the Colosseum, the obsession with the Roman Empire amongst men is unreal. It's not hard to see why, though. The Roman Empire symbolized the peak of power, authority, and influence in the ancient world. This was the size of the mighty Roman Empire. At its peak in 117 CE, the Roman Empire stretched over 2 million square miles. For scale, that's about half the size of the United States at a time when tribes squabble for small pieces of the world. From east to west, the empire stretched from Iberia to Iraq, and from north to south, it stretched from England to Egypt. The Roman Empire was without a doubt one of the largest of the ancient kingdoms, and perhaps the most impactful in modern culture. The Roman Empire has shaped the way we think, build, rule, live, and transact in the modern world, with traces of its ancient systems deeply engraved in ours centuries later. From the deep philosophical bonds that shape society, to violent military acts that we perform on each other, the impact of the Roman Empire is a legacy that cannot be done away within the story of the human race. In today's video, we will be going on a deep dive to explore everything related to the rise, growth, and ultimate fall of the Roman Empire. We will dive into the mythic tales and the miraculous deeds that made the Romans unequaled at their peak. Perhaps as we study the people of old, we too may learn from both their feats and their misdeeds. So let's get into it. Let's talk about the glorious story of Rome. When we talk about the history of the Roman state, historians tend to divide it into three large periods. These are the Roman Kingdom, starting around 753 BCE, the Roman Republic, starting around 509 BCE, and lastly, the Roman Empire, starting around 27 BCE. Each of these periods is marked by its own milestones, myths, and great figures as you will see in the coming minutes. So let's start with the period with the least recorded about it, Early Rome, also known as the Roman Kingdom. As we do that, drop a like on the video to expand our own business basics kingdom. Every like helps with the video's reach, and that keeps our little kingdom growing. Okay, back to the other kingdom video. Most of what we know of early Rome are remnants that come from oral tradition, as most of the written history has been lost to time. However, the origins of Rome always begin with the tale of the two brothers. You might find this odd, but this tale is always at the origins of Roman city civilization, and hence its importance. The recorded tale goes like this. At the beginning of a distant time, there were twin brothers, Romulus and Remus. Their father was Mars, the god of war. Their mother was Rhea Silvia, a vestal virgin and daughter of the king, Numitor. Numitor's brother, Amulius, had taken the throne from him and had forced Rhea Silvia to become a vestal virgin so that she would not have any children who might try to take back the throne. When the boys were born, Amulius seized them, put them into a basket, and threw them into the river Tiber. He hoped that they would drown. Like every good tale, however, that did not happen. Instead, the boys were rescued by a she-wolf who fed the babies with her own milk and cared for them. The two sons would grow up and be found and cared for by the shepherd, Faustulus, who took them home and looked after them until they were grown up. When they were, the two young men discovered who they really were and decided to kill Amulius and put their grandfather back on the throne. After doing this, they decided to build a city of their own, but could not agree where to build it. Remus favored the Aventine Hill, but Romulus wanted to use the Palatine Hill. They could not reach an agreement and so each began to build his own city enclosed with walls. One day, Remus visited Romulus and made fun of his wall by jumping over it and saying how easily it could be breached. Romulus was so annoyed that he killed Remus and said that he would kill anyone who mocked his city or tried to break through the walls of Rome. The legend says that Romulus became the first king of Rome in 753 BC and populated his new city with runaway slaves and convicted criminals. He stole women from the Sabine tribe to provide wives for the slaves and criminals and to populate his new city. The Sabine tribe was not happy about this and declared war on Rome. The war went on for many years, but eventually, the Sabine tribe and Romulus reached an agreement and the Sabines became a part of Rome under the kingship of Romulus. The legend ends by telling how Romulus was carried up to the heavens by his father, Mars, and was worshipped as the god, Carinus. To this day, the first recorded king of Rome is Romulus, the godfather of the Romans. In its time till the kingdom transitioned into the Republic, Rome had a reign of seven kings. These kings ruled the settlement in Rome's first centuries. The traditional chronology allows 243 years for their combined reigns, an average of almost 35 years. Let's go through each of these kings so we have an early foothold into what Roman rule was like and what each of them achieved. The timeline of the kings was like this, and so we will start with the Wolf King, Romulus, and a few things that marked his reign. 
We already mentioned earlier that Romulus founded Rome, a kingdom he named after himself. What's key to note is that he permitted men of all classes to come to Rome as citizens, including slaves and free men without distinction. This incorporation of diversity is what stood at the center of Rome's diversity, making it a meshing bowl for various people, albeit in different classes. Romulus is also credited with establishing the city's religious, legal, and political institutions. The kingdom was established by unanimous acclaim with him at the helm when Romulus called the citizenry to a council for the purposes of determining their government. Romulus established the Senate as an advisory council with the appointment of a hundred of the most noble men in the community. Given how these men came to Rome in the first place, we take this noble part with a grain of it. But oh well. These men he called paters, and their descendants became the patricians. To project command, he surrounded himself with attendants, in particular, the Twelve Lictors. He created three divisions of horsemen called centuries. These were called the Rams, Tides, and Luceras. He also divided the populace into 30 curi. The curi formed the voting units into the popular assemblies. Other than the very creation of the empire, one of the things that Romulus is mostly known for is an atrocity he committed against the Sabine people. Early on at the beginning of the Roman kingdom, an incident known as this happened. To provide his citizens with wives, Romulus invited the neighboring tribes to a festival in Rome, where the Romans committed a mass abduction of young women among the attendees. The accounts vary from 30 to 683 women taken. When you factor in that the victim tribe originally had a population of around 3,000 Latins, you can see why this was a big number. War broke out when Romulus refused to return the captives, but later concessions were reached in the interest of peace. None of them involved the return of the women, though. Romulus essentially kidnapped women and got away with it. The founding king reigned for about 37 years before he vanished. According to Roman legend, the story is that he was taken up to Mount Olympus in a whirlwind and made a god. For the rest of the existence of the empire, Romulus was worshipped as the god Carinus. He became not only one of the three major gods of Rome, but the very likeness of the city itself. In all fairness, as the founding father, he deserved that much. The disappearance of Romulus left a void that needed to be filled. Rome needed a king. Under popular pressure, the Senate finally chose Sabine Numa Pompilius to succeed Romulus. On account of his reputation for justice and piety, Numa's reign was a good one, largely marked by peace and religious reform. He constructed a new temple to Janus, the god of gates and doors, and after establishing peace with Rome's neighbors, closed the doors of the temple to indicate a state of peace. They remained closed for the rest of his reign. We don't know about you, but that is a big flex for a king. He established the Vestal Virgins at Rome, as well as the Sili and the Flamines for Jupiter, Mars, and Carinus. He also established the office and duties of Pontifex Maximus. He reformed the Roman calendar by adjusting it for the solar and lunar years, as well as by adding the months of January and February to bring the total number of months to 12. Those of you born in January and February can thank him for bringing you to the spotlight. Numa's reign lasted a whopping 43 years, and was marked by some of the best times for the Roman kingdom. Those who liked the element of peace and quiet times would come to hate the king who succeeded Numa. Numa's successor was Tullus Hostilius, a war-hungry veteran with an appetite. His warlike nature certainly was not helped by the fact that Tullus lacked any respect for the gods, and hence had no inhibitors. Tullus waged war against Alba Longa, Fidene, Vei, and the Sabines. During Tullus's reign, the city of Alba Longa was completely destroyed, and Tullus integrated its population into Rome. Though violent, his means did contribute to the expansion of the Roman kingdom. Other than his role in the expansion of the kingdom, another legacy of Tullus's was the construction of a new home for the Senate, the Curia Hostilia. This building survived 562 years after his death. That says a lot about Roman engineering. We should resurrect some of those because the cheap construction these days is just wow. It is said, though, he had neglected the gods all his life when he felt sick at the end of his life. He called on Jupiter to save his life. The response? Well, it's said that Jupiter responded with a bolt of lightning that burned the king and his house to ashes, ending his 32-year reign. Following the mysterious death of Tullus, the Romans elected a peaceful and religious king in his place. Numa's grandson, Ancus Martius. Much like his grandfather, Ancus did little to expand the borders of Rome and only fought wars to defend the territory. He also built Rome's first prison on the Capitoline Hill. Ancus further fortified the Geniculum Hill on the western bank and built the first bridge across the Tiber River. He also founded the port of the Ostia Antica on the Tyrrhenian Sea and established Rome's first salt works, as well as the sea's first aqueduct. Rome grew as Ancus used diplomacy to peacefully unite smaller surrounding cities into alliance with Rome. 
Thus, he completed the conquest of the Latins and relocated them to the Aventine Hill, thus forming the plebeian class of Romans. Ancus died a natural death like his grandfather after 25 years as king, marking the end of Rome's Latin Sabine kings. Quick note, can you see how the peaceful kings had peaceful deaths and the violent ones had violent mysterious deaths? Karma has a sense of humor, doesn't it? Let's move on with these first fathers of the Roman kingdom. Next up was Lucius Tarquinius Priscus. He was the fifth king of Rome and the first of Etruscan birth. After immigrating to Rome, he gained favor with Ancus, who later adopted him as his son. Upon ascending the throne, he waged wars against the Sabines and the Etruscans, doubling the size of Rome and bringing great treasures to the city. To accommodate the influx of population, the Aventine and Salian hills were populated. One of his first reforms was to add 100 new members to the Senate from the conquered Etruscan tribes, bringing the total number of senators to 200. He used the treasures Rome had acquired from the conquests to build great monuments for Rome. Among these was Rome's great sewer system, the Coica Maxima, which he used to drain the swamp-like area between the seven hills of Rome. In his place, he began construction on the Roman Forum. He also founded the Roman Games. Priscus also initiated great building projects, including the city's first bridge, the Pons Sublicius. The most famous is the Circus Maximus, a giant stadium for chariot races. After that, he started the building of the temple fortress to the god Jupiter on the Capitoline Hill. However, before it was completed, he was killed by a son of Ancus Martius after 38 years as king. His reign is best remembered for introducing the Roman symbols of military and civil offices, and the Roman triumph being the first Roman to celebrate one. Priscus was succeeded by his son-in-law, Servius Tullius, Roman second king of Etruscan birth, and the son of a slave. Like his father-in-law, Servius fought successful wars against the Etruscans. He used the booty to build the first wall all around the seven hills of Rome, the Pomerium. He also reorganized the army as he was a military leader. Servius Tullius instituted a new constitution, further developing the citizen classes. He instituted Rome's first census, which divided the population into five economic classes and formed the Centuriate Assembly. He used the census to divide the population into four urban tribes based on location, thus establishing the tribal assembly. He also oversaw the construction of the Temple of Diana on the Aventine Hill. This is why it has been important to cover these kings in detail, because you can see just how Roman culture was shaped one brick at a time. Much of what was the Roman order of things began here, with the kingdom growing a piece at a time. Servius's reforms made a big change in Roman life, voting rights based on socioeconomic status, favoring elites. However, over time, Servius increasingly favored the poor in order to gain support from plebeians, often at the expense of patricians. After a 44-year reign, Servius was killed in a conspiracy by his daughter, Tullia, and her husband, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus. What is with Romans and violent or mysterious deaths? The seventh and final king of Rome was Lucius Tarquinius Superbus. He was the son of Priscus and the son-in-law of Servius, whom he and his wife had killed. Tarquinius waged several wars against Rome's neighbors, including against the Volsci, Gabi, and the Rutuli. He secured Rome's position as head of the Latin cities. He also engaged in a series of public works, notably the completion of the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, and works on the Cloaca Maxima and the Circus Maximus. However, Tarquin's reign is remembered for his use of violence and intimidation to control Rome and his disrespect for Roman customs and the Roman Senate. Perhaps this was a foreshadowing of what the Roman Empire was to become. His downfall came at the hands of the sins of his son. His son, Sextus Tarquinius, forced himself on Lucrezia, wife and daughter to powerful Roman nobles. Lucrezia told her relatives about the attack and committed suicide to avoid the dishonor of the episode. Four men, led by Julius Junius Brutus, including... Lucius Tarquinius Collatinus, Publius Valerius Poplicola, and Spurius Lucretius Tricipitinus incited a revolution that deposed and excelled Tarquinius and his family from Rome in 509 BC. The old king was viewed so negatively that the word for King Rex held a negative connotation in the Latin language until the fall of the Roman Empire. With the fall of the last king, the Roman Kingdom fell and the Roman Republic began. This new government would survive for the next 500 years until the rise of Julius Caesar and Augustus and would cover a period during which Rome's authority and area of control extended to cover vast areas of Europe, North Africa, and West Asia. Let's look at that second age, the age of the Roman Republic. The Roman Republic began officially in 509 BCE after the group of noblemen we mentioned overthrew the last king of Rome, Tarquin. The Romans replaced the king with two consuls, 
These were rulers who had many of the same powers as the king, but were elected to serve one-year terms. Each consul could veto or reject the actions of the other consul. Although the office of consul probably did not exist in its final form until around 300 BCE, the idea behind this change, to prevent any one man from becoming too powerful, was present early on in Roman thought, and shaped many of Rome's political institutions to the core. Roman political institutions largely reflected Roman society, which was divided into two classes, the patricians, who were the wealthy elites, and the plebeians, who were the common people. Initially, only the patricians were able to hold political office and make important decisions. For example, plebeians could not join the Roman Senate, an advisory body that recommended laws to councils. To become a senator, a Roman had to have held a political office and plebeians could not. Over time, however, the plebeians were able to gain more influence in the political system. Between the years 494 and 287 BCE, new political offices for plebeians were created, and access to higher office, including the consulship, was open to them. Voting assemblies and councils were established that gave plebeians more say in the politics of Rome. In 287 BCE, a law removed the last barrier to plebeian political participation by abolishing the requirement that proposed laws had to be approved by patrician senators before the plebeian council could consider them. The plebeian council had real power and influence in Roman politics, and some plebeians gained power and wealth under these new arrangements, but many remained poor. One reason that political rights did not lead to major changes was the Comitia Centurata, the main voting assembly that elected consuls and other important officials, was organized based on wealth. Each century, or voting group, had one vote, but the wealthy were split into smaller groups than the poor, giving the vote of a wealthy Roman more influence. Let's talk about the general facets that made up the pillars of the Roman Republic. Let's start with that very voting system we were just talking about. Although the voting system might appear a deliberate strategy to empower the wealthy, it was actually a reflection of the Roman military structure. The Comitia Centuriata was named for the century, literally a group of a hundred soldiers, though in practice, the division was never so exact, which was the standard Roman military unit under the kingdom and most of the Republican era. Men were divided into classes based on their wealth because soldiers had to provide their own equipment. Only wealthy Romans could afford high-quality weapons and armor, which made them more effective soldiers. That says something about how fast and whoever could rise in the ranks and be distinguished. Men without property were not eligible for military service, and these poorest Romans, though the largest class in numbers, were placed into the smallest number of centuries for voting. A huge part of the reason that the Romans saw no problem with allowing the wealthy to have greater political influence was that they believed that those who had the most wealth also had the most to lose from Roman defeat. So the wealthy had the better motivation to be good soldiers, and a better sense of what was good policy for Rome. It makes sense in a way when you think about it. It definitely made sense then. When it comes to how the Roman Republic grew, and it did, it all comes down to the preservation, believe it or not. The Romans initially did not set out any deliberate plan to build an empire. Instead, Rome expanded as it came into conflict with surrounding city-states, kingdoms, and empires, and had to create ways to incorporate these new territories and populations. The Romans did not try to turn everyone they conquered into a Roman. For the most part, cities and regions that came under Roman control were allowed to maintain their existing cultural and political institutions. The only major requirement that Rome imposed on its defeated enemies was that they provide soldiers for military campaigns. In the ancient world, military victory usually meant a share of the loot taken from the conquered, so participating on the winning side of a conflict offered incentives to Rome's new allies. We mean, who doesn't want to be on the winning side? What's that old saying again? If you can't beat them, well, you know the rest. Most conquered enemies were offered some level of Roman citizenships, sometimes with full voting rights. Because a person had to be physically present in Rome to vote, the extension of voting rights beyond the population of the city itself did not drastically alter the political situation in Rome. However, the offer of citizenship did help to build a sense of shared identity around loyalty to Rome. That is what kept the Republic united and intact. But as the Empire grew, methods had to be found for people management in the service of order and peace. In order to manage these new territories that came under their influence, the Romans created formal provinces and appointed former political office holders to manage them. Given the distance between most provinces and Rome, these governors often had considerable power and flexibility in dealing with local issues. The Romans tried to create a balance between giving governors enough power to control their provinces and preventing governors from becoming so powerful that they could challenge Rome's authority. The effectiveness of this varied with the governor and the time, but safe to say that the governors had quite the power in the Republic. What mattered to Rome was largely the peace and prosperity of an area. If that was in check, then well, everything else was secondary. Speaking of prosperity, 
During the reign of the Roman Republic, economic development was a priority. Although Rome had little interest in managing the daily affairs of its allies, it had to adapt as its influence spread. Roads were a way to extend Roman military and economic power. They made the movement of both soldiers and goods easier and faster. The Romans also minted coins as their influence spread, and in 211 BCE, they introduced a small silver coin called a denarius, which became the standard unit of currency for much of the Roman period. If you watch any movies set in ancient times, we're sure this is not a word that is foreign to you. A standardized currency facilitated trade across the growing Roman world. Coins could be exchanged for any goods or services and were easy to transport. Currency made it easier to relocate and direct resources, and this in turn encouraged more economic interactions. The Romans also engaged in trade across the Mediterranean Sea. Their network of trading contacts expanded along with their political influence, since trade relations were usually dependent on good political relations. The combination of fighting piracy, building roads, minting coins, and extending military protection over an increasingly large area created many opportunities for economic interactions and growth. Still on that note of economic development, like all ancient societies, Rome's economy was based on agriculture, which was incredibly labor-intensive. As Rome fought more foreign wars, many small landholders were away serving in the military for longer periods. If they failed to return or their farms went bankrupt in their absence, wealthy Romans bought their land, creating larger and larger farms, known as latifundia. Further, it was common practice to enslave and sell war captives. That is how a large number of slaves found themselves on the Italian peninsula. Because of economies of scale and because enslaved people could be made to work longer and harder than free Romans, this trend further increased economic production. The increased income from expansion supported development by creating a demand for greater supplies of agricultural produce. Some owners of large farms even switched from growing staple grains to high-value crops, such as olives and grapes, or raising animals. Even as the empire expanded, all important political decisions for the empire were still made in Rome, and the city itself grew and changed with its empire. An increasingly large urban population requires the development of sanitation systems to maintain a minimum level of public health. So Rome answered that call. The Romans had developed a sewer system early in the city's history. The first aqueduct, a structure to deliver water to the city over long distances, was built in 312 BCE, as was the first road, the Via Appia. That road is believed to be the first Roman road to feature the use of lime cement. The ability to collect taxes and currency, growth of economic production and trade, and military victories all provided funds for building projects such as the Via Appia in Rome. Besides roads, aqueducts, and sewers, the Romans built temples and political buildings. Victorious generals would dedicate temples to particular gods, and they paid for these temples with the loot they captured on a campaign. This would in turn increase their popularity among the masses and gain them favor. So that was the general state of Rome, but now let's get onto the specifics of the Roman Republic. During the 6th century BCE, Rome became one of the more important states in Latium, owing to the achievements of its Etruscan overlords. But Tiber, Prenest, and Tusculum were equally important Latin states. Although the Latins dwelled in politically independent towns, their common language and culture produced cooperation in religion, law, and warfare. The Latin states occasionally waged war among themselves, but in times of common danger, they banded together for mutual defense. Toward the end of the 5th century BCE, the Romans began to expand at the expense of the Etruscan states, possibly propelled by population growth. Rome's first two major wars against organized states were fought with Fidene, a town near Rome, and against Veii, an important Etruscan city between 437 to 426 BCE. Before Roman strength increased further, a marauding Gallic tribe swept down the Po River Valley and sacked Rome in 390 BCE. The invaders departed, however, after they received a ransom in gold. Forty years of hard fighting in Latium and Etruria were required to restore Rome's power. When Rome became increasingly dominant in the Latin League, the Latin took up arms against Rome to maintain their independence. The ensuing Latin War from 340 to 338 BCE was quickly decided in Rome's favor. During the Roman Republic years, Rome was now the master of central Italy and spent the next decade pushing forward its frontier through conquest and colonization. After three wars against the Samnites in the north, the third in 298 to 290 BCE, and the Pyrrhic War of 280 to 275 BCE against Greek towns in the south, Rome was the unquestioned master of Italy. Soon, Rome's success led it into conflict with Carthage and established commercial power in northern Africa for control of the Mediterranean. The ensuing battles, known as the Punic Wars, spanned the years 264 to 146 BCE. Two great military geniuses were among the leaders in these wars, 
Hannibal led the Carthaginian forces from about 220 to 200, and we also had the great Roman commander, Scipio Africanus, the Elder. We would be abusing the essence of this video if we did not take a quick moment to talk about Scipio's wars and Hannibal. Born Plubius Cornelius Scipio, Scipio was born into one of the great patrician families in Rome, with his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather having all been consuls in their day. In 218 BCE, Scipio's father, also named Plubius Cornelius Scipio, held the consulship in one of the most critical years of Rome's history. Scipio's rise to power was accelerated by family and national disaster that came upon him as both his father and uncle were defeated and killed in Spain, where the Carthaginians swept forward to the Ebro River. In 210, the Romans decided to send reinforcements to Spain, but it is said that no senior general would undertake the task and that young Scipio offered himself as a candidate. At any rate, the Roman people decided to invest him with a command there. Although he was technically a privatist, this grant of a military command outside Italy by the people to a man who had not been a praetor or consul created an important constitutional precedent. Thus, Scipio was given the chance to avenge the deaths of his father and uncle in Spain, where he hoped not merely to hold the Carthaginian armies at bay and prevent their sending reinforcements to Hannibal in Italy, but to resume his father's offensive policy, to turn back the tide of war and to drive the enemy out of the Iberian Peninsula. Such a task must have seemed impossible in 210, but Scipio had the confidence and ability. Listen as we retell the genius of this commander in the battles that followed. From his headquarters, at Terrico in 209, Scipio suddenly launched a combined military and naval assault on the enemy's headquarters at Carthago Nova, knowing that all three enemy armies in Spain were at least 10 days distant from the city. Polybius, a Greek historian, relates that Scipio had heard from Spanish fishermen at Taraco that the water level around Carthago Nova varied daily and that it was especially low in the afternoon. Helped by a lowering of the water in a lagoon, which exposed the northern wall, he successfully stormed the city this possibly tidal phenomenon attributed to the help of Neptune was perhaps enhanced by an offshore wind. At any rate, it increased the troops' beliefs in their commander's divine support. In Carthago Nova, he gained stores and supplies, Spanish hostages, the local silver mines, a splendid harbor, and a base for an advance farther south. After training his army in new tactics, Scipio defeated the Carthaginian commander, Hasdrubal Barca, at Baikula in Baetica. Whereas normally the two rear ranks of a Roman army closely supported the front line, Scipio in this battle, under a screen of light troops, divided his main forces, which fell upon the enemy's flanks. When Hasdrubal broke away, ultimately to join his brother Hannibal in Italy, Scipio wisely declined the impossible task of trying to stop him, and decided rather to accomplish his mission in Spain, which was the defeat of the other two Carthaginian armies still there. This he brilliantly achieved in 206 at the Battle of Ilapa. Over several days of posturing and light skirmishing between the arrayed armies, Scipio lulled the Carthaginian commanders, Hostrubal and Mago, into a sense of routine. On the day of the battle, Scipio dramatically altered that routine, arriving in full force at dawn and changing the order of his troops so that where he was strong, the Carthaginians were weak. Talk about the ultimate Uno reverse card. He used his Roman veterans to execute a series of audacious flanking maneuvers while his fickle Spanish allies held the enemy's main forces in place. The Carthaginian armies were destroyed, and Asdrubal and Mago fled the field. Scipio then secured Gades, thus making Roman control of Spain complete. He, however, was not quite done. After he was elected consul for 205, Scipio boldly determined to disregard Hannibal, already largely contained in southern Italy, and to strike instead at Africa. Once he had beaten down political opposition in the Senate, he crossed to Sicily with an army consisting partly of volunteers, some of whom had also survived the disaster of Cannae and sought to redeem themselves. While preparing his troops, he boldly snatched Locri et Persephone in the toe of Italy from Hannibal's grasp. In 204, he landed with perhaps 35,000 men in Africa, where he besieged Utica. Early in 203, with the help of Rome's new Numidian ally, Massinissa, he burned the camps of Hasdrubal and his Numidian ally, Syphax. Then, sweeping down on the forces that the enemy was trying to muster at the Great Plains on the upper Bagradas, he smashed that army with a double flanking movement. We're no generals, but man, Hasdrubal must have been tired of taking L's from Scipio. You would think that all this losing meant surrender and peace would ensue, right? Well, even the Carthaginians thought so. After Scipio's capture of Tunis, the Carthaginians sought peace terms, but Hannibal's subsequent return to Africa led to their renewal of the war in 202. This is where the battles that Rome celebrated with unimaginable joy come into play. Hannibal was placed in command of an army of many raw recruits and 80 untrained elephants. Scipio advanced southwestern to join Massinissa, 
who was taking his invaluable cavalry to Scipio's support. Then Scipio turned eastward to face Hannibal at Zama, having secured the better watering holes and the best terrain. In the first phase of the battle, Scipio largely neutralized the feared Carthaginian war elephants by using skirmishes to draw them into corridors between the densely packed heavy infantry, thus minimizing their impact on the battle. The Battle of Zama also demonstrated that Rome held the advantage in cavalry, especially with the addition of Massinissa's Numidians that Hannibal had previously exploited. Taking advantage of the confusion in the wake of the elephant charge, Scipio's cavalry fell onto the Carthaginian horsemen, driving them from the field. At first, Scipio's outflanking tactics failed against the master from whom he had learned them, but Hannibal widened his lines and did not allow his first two ranks of soldiers to back up, instead pushing them forward and out to the sides, with his veterans at the rear. The issue was decided when the Roman and Numidian cavalry, having broken off the pursuit of the Punic horsemen, fell on the rear of Hannibal's army. They decimated it. The Roman victory was complete, and the long war ended. Scipio granted comparatively lenient terms to Carthage and to Hannibal personally. According to Polybius, this battle marked the first time a Roman could envision a global perspective of a future empire. In honor of his victory, Scipio was named Africanus. That is why he's referred to in history and in time as Scipio Africanus. What a legend, right? The defeat of this powerful rival sustained the Romans' acquisitive momentum, and they set their sights on the entire Mediterranean area. To the east, the Romans defeated Syria, Macedonia, Greece, and Egypt, all of which had until been part of the decaying Hellenistic Empire. The Romans also destroyed the Achaean League and burned Corinth in 146 BCE. Won through massive effort and with inevitable losses, the newly acquired lands and diverse peoples populating them proved a challenge to govern effectively. The Romans organized the conquered peoples into provinces, under the control of appointed governors with absolute power over all non-Roman citizens, and stationed troops in each, ready to exercise appropriate force if necessary. In Rome proper, the majority of citizens suffered the consequences of living in a nation that had its eyes invariably trained on the far horizon. Roman farmers were unable to raise crops to compete economically with produce from the provinces, and many migrated to the city. For a time, the common people were placated with bread and circuses, as the authorities attempted to divert their attention from the gap between their standard of living and that of the aristocracy. Slavery fueled the Roman economy, and its rewards for the wealthy turned out to be disastrous for the working classes. Tensions grew and civil wars erupted. The ensuing period of unrest and revolution marked the transition of Rome from a republic to an empire. Notable figures in the civil wars included Gaius Marius, a military leader who was elected consul seven times, and Sulla, an army officer. The later stages of the civil wars encompassed the careers of Pompey, the orator Cicero, and Julius Caesar, who eventually took full power over Rome as its dictator. The full story of Julius Caesar will need a whole video to explore. We mean, who does not know the name of Julius Caesar? The man is spoken about in the same breath as the likes of Alexander the Great and Genghis Khan. It would be a disservice to make a Roman Empire video and not talk a little about the great Caesar. So well, let's have it. Julius Caesar was born on July 12th, 100 BCE to a noble family who were part of the patricians. During his youth, the Roman Republic was in chaos. Seizing the opportunity, Caesar advanced in the political system and briefly became governor of Spain, a Roman province. Returning to Rome, he formed political alliances that helped him become governor of Gaul, an area that included what is now France and Belgium. His Roman troops conquered Gallic tribes by exploiting tribal rivalries. Throughout his eight-year governorship, he increased his military power and, more importantly, acquired plunder from Gaul. When his rivals in Rome demanded he return as a private citizen, he used these riches to support his army and march them across the Rubicon River, crossing from Gaul into Italy. This was the beginning of the conflict between Caesar and another of Rome's great generals, Pompey. A buildup of tensions starting in late 50 BC, with both Caesar and Pompey refusing to back down, led to the outbreak of civil war. Pompey and his allies induced the Senate to demand Caesar give up his provinces and armies in the opening days of 49 BC. Caesar refused and instead marched on Rome. The war was fought in Italy, Illyria, Greece, Egypt, Africa, and Hispania. Pompey defeated Caesar in 48 BC at the Battle of Dyrrhachium, but was himself defeated decisively at the Battle of Pharsalus. Many former Pompeians, including Marcus Junius Brutus and Cicero, surrendered after the battle, while others, such as Cato the Younger and Metellus Scipio, fought on. Pompey fled to Egypt, where he was assassinated on arrival. Caesar intervened in Africa and Asia Minor before attacking North Africa, where he defeated Scipio in 46 BC at the Battle of Thapsus. Scipio and Cato committed suicide shortly thereafter. 
The following year, Caesar defeated the last of the Pompeians under his former lieutenant, Labienus, in the Battle of Munda, concluding what was a brutal and long power struggle. Returning to Italy, Caesar consolidated his power and made himself dictator. Caesar wielded his power to enlarge the Senate, create needed government reforms, and decrease Rome's debt. At the same time, he sponsored the building of the Forum Iulium and rebuilt two city-states, Carthage and Corinth. He also granted citizenship to foreigners living within the Roman Republic. In 44 BCE, Caesar declared himself dictator perpetuo, which meant that he was a dictator in perpetuity. That was when the final stroke of the pen was done. His increasing power and great ambition agitated many senators who feared Caesar aspired to be king. Only a month after Caesar declared power, a group of senators, among them Marcus Junius Brutus, Caesar's second choice as heir, Gaius Cassius Longinus assassinated Caesar in fear of his absolute power. It is alleged that as Caesar was being stabbed, he looked up and recognized his friend Brutus among the assassins and said, A2 Brute, meaning, even you Brutus? Whether he did indeed say these words or not, Caesar's death marked what was essentially a done with the stage moment for Rome. After his assassination in 44 BCE, the triumvirate of Mark Antony, Lepidus, and Octavian, Caesar's nephew, ruled. It was not long before Octavian went to war against Antony in northern Africa, and after his victory at Actium in 31 BCE, he was crowned Rome's first emperor, Augustus. This marked the end of the Roman Republic and the beginning of the third phase of Rome, the Roman Empire. Though Augustus took the title princeps, meaning first or foremost among equals, there's no doubt that Augustus, and only Augustus, ruled the Roman Empire. He enacted a set of reforms that changed Roman politics and launched a golden age of peace and stability within the empire. This period, from 27 BCE to 180 CE, is known as the Pax Romana, meaning Roman peace. Beginning with Augustus, the Roman emperors seized more power over the political life of the empire and its military. They kept many of the titles and traditions of the Republic, but in practice, they ruled as dictators. The figure of the emperor became central to Roman political life. His image was minted on coins, and he was linked to the gods. Augustus only ever claimed to be the son of a god, but after his death, the Senate declared him a full god, much like Romulus centuries prior. Several later emperors were also honored in this way. The Roman Empire expanded during the first century after Augustus, reaching its height in 117 CE. These wars of expansion shaped life in the empire. They made military service an important way for men to gain political power and wealth. Rome's wars of conquest ensured a steady supply of enslaved people. These people, unlike citizens, could not be drafted into the Roman army, so they were a more reliable labor source for the wealthy people who enslaved them. By 1 CE, as much as one-third of the people living on the Italian peninsula were enslaved. These people were first to work on the plantations owned by wealthy Romans, who turned from subsistence farming toward more lucrative crops like olives. Enslaved people could be freed or purchased their own freedom. People freed in this way gained limited rights and their children were born Roman citizens. This incentivized this deed. The Roman Empire under Augustus ruled about 45 million people. Only 4 million of these were citizens. At its peak, Rome was the largest city in the world with a population of 1 million or so. The empire controlled 2 million square miles of territory spanning this distance. This many people and this much land required sophisticated administration and technology. Hundreds of miles of Roman roads connected the empire, linking its cities, allowing its armies to march, and facilitating trade. Aqueducts linked major cities to the essential resource of fresh water. Whatever systems of governance and administration that Rome previously had, they were significantly upgraded to match the growth of the empire. As much as the Romans were conquerors, the Romans generally avoided forcing their religion on the people they conquered. As long as people paid their taxes to Rome and followed Roman rules, they were allowed to practice their own religion. This tolerance changed Roman culture. Early Romans adopted Greek gods and religious practices, with some alterations to suit a Roman context. However, as the empire expanded, cross-cultural encounters reshaped Roman approaches to religion. Roman soldiers and officials who had journeyed to the edges of the empire returned home with new beliefs from abroad. For example, the cult of Mithras, inspired by Mithra from Persian Zoroastrianism, spread across the Roman world. The cult of Mithras was popular among soldiers, which is part of why it spread so quickly through the empire. Similarly, other foreign gods like Isis from Egypt and Baal from Mesopotamia were refashioned and incorporated into the Roman pantheon, which was a group of gods. If you were a Christian, it wasn't a great time to be one. Early Christians faced persecution for refusing to honor the emperor. Unlike Roman religion, Christianity was a missionary religion. Their goal was to convert the citizens and subjects of Rome. It worked. 
because by 313 CE, the Roman Emperor Constantine had legally recognized Christianity, and by 380, Christianity was the Empire's state religion. That validated the work of the earlier Christians who had died for their beliefs. Talk about faith and its rewards, am I right? As the Roman Empire expanded and got richer, people in Rome wanted to use their new wealth to buy luxuries from far away. Luxury shopping may sound unimportant. However, the vast trade networks that were extended to meet this demand were anything but. Merchants linked Rome to the Chinese Han Empire, trading fancy silks and other luxuries. By the time they reached Rome, these luxuries traveled across thousands of miles of desert, mountains, and sea. There's some debate as to how far these networks extended. It's unlikely that the two empires ever directly interacted. Goods moved more like a relay race than a marathon. Networks of merchants in the Parathion and Kushan empires and around the Indian Ocean carried spices and silk west, and Roman metals and glass east. Most silk that made its way to Rome came through India, where archaeologists have found many Roman coins. Spices from the Indian Ocean were somewhat common in Rome. In the earliest Roman cookbook, titled Apicius, some recipes call for pepper, nutmeg, cloves, and cumin, all of which came from the Indian Ocean. But it wasn't all spice and silk. Uninvited germs allowed several devastating plagues to spread along these routes of exchange. Spices and diseases aside, we can't underestimate the importance of silk. These trade networks grew because Romans craved this soft and beautiful fabric that only the Chinese knew how to make. There was so much silk being imported that the Roman Senate restricted the trade. They worried that too much Roman wealth was leaving the empire in exchange for silk, and the trade imbalance would ruin the Roman economy. However, silk was so popular that attempts to ban it ultimately failed. You know, it kind of reminds us of the prohibition in the US. Speaking of that particular fabric, silk tells us quite a bit about the place of women in Roman society. For example, we know that part of the reason the Roman Senate tried to ban silk was because they believed the fabric was too revealing and undermined good Roman morality. They worried that too much silk corrupted Rome's masculine virtues. Wealthy women might have been able to afford the luxuries of distant lands, but much of their public life was dictated by men in Rome's patriarchal society. The early years of the Roman Empire saw many such attempts to regulate women. Augustus passed new laws that gave advantages to women who married and had children, and punished those who did not. Augustus hoped to impose an image of the moral Roman family on the empire. In addition to regulations on women's bodies and sexuality, women in the Roman Empire lacked full legal rights. They were technically citizens, but could not vote or hold political office. Women were required to have a male relative represent them in financial and legal matters. Still, many women in the empire worked within these constraints to exercise political power. There are instances of women who ran the estates of dead husbands. Women could divorce their husbands, though the husband retained custody of their children. Women of lower classes entered public life through work, while wealthy women often acted as influential advisors to their sons and husbands. When you think of beating the system, think of Roman women. The last years of Rome were filled with struggle and strife. The empire now faced several problems, usurpers, and strife chief among them. In 284 CE, the emperor, Diocletian, divided the empire into two administrative halves, east and west. In 324 CE, Emperor Constantine founded a new capital city in his name, Constantinople. The city was a better location than Rome since it was closer to Rome's wealthiest provinces. At first, the split between east and west was purely an administrative change to help the empire run better. The Roman Empire was still a single entity, but increasingly, the two halves were ruled independently. So by the time the Germanic general Odacior overthrew the last Western Roman Emperor in 476, the Western and Eastern halves of the Empire were governed as two separate empires. The last Roman Emperor of the West, who was deposed, was called Romulus Augustulus. Befitting that the Empire started with Romulus in Rome and ended with another Romulus as well. The East, however, always richer and stronger, continued as the Byzantine Empire through the European Middle Ages. Officially, it's said that the Roman Empire ended right here in 476, but did it really? We think not. Despite the West falling to the Germanic tribes in the East, there was consolidation and even expansion. The Roman Empire remained a power in the Eastern Mediterranean for another 1,000 years, even reconquering the Italian peninsula in the 6th century. Though historians have rebranded it as the Byzantine Empire, the people living here thought of themselves as Romans. For centuries after the so-called Fall of Rome, these Romans continued to be the most powerful state in the Mediterranean world. Eventually, however, the Roman Empire fell and the last of its victories has been buried in history. However, the civilization of ancient Rome had a lasting legacy on world history. Not only did ancient Rome cover a vast amount of land at its peak, but it also existed for over a thousand years. The legacy that such an empire leaves is nothing to scoff at. Ancient Rome is still felt today in Western culture in areas such as government, law, language, architecture, engineering, and religion. Let us break down each of those. 
Let's start with the government, shall we? Many modern day governments are modeled after the Roman Republic. Concepts such as the balance of powers, veto, and representation were developed and recorded by the Romans. The United States has three branches of government similar to the Roman Republic. The executive branch, which is the president, is similar to the elected consuls of Rome. The legislative branch, which is Congress, is similar to the Roman assemblies like the Senate. Finally, the judicial branch is similar to the praetors of Rome. The US even named one house of Congress, the Senate, after the Senate of Rome. Let's move on to the next one, law. Roman law has had a significant influence over the modern day laws of many countries. Legal ideas like trials by jury, civil rights, contracts, personal property, legal wills, and corporations all were influenced by Roman law and the Roman way of looking at things. What we have to this day in our courts are principles founded and exercised in the courts of Rome centuries ago. Language is also another facet that remains as a legacy of Rome. The Latin language spoken by the Romans spread throughout much of Western Europe during the time of the Roman Empire. Many languages evolved from Latin. These languages are called the Romance languages. They include French, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, and Romanian. Around 800 million people around the world speak a Romance language today. Remember that when you are romancing your girl in an exotic tongue, we can't begin to talk about the Roman legacy without talking about the architecture. The buildings and architecture of ancient Rome still influence many building designs today. The neoclassical architecture movement of the 18th century was a return to many of the ideas of the Romans. You can see the influence of Roman architecture in government buildings, large banks, and even some famous buildings like the United States Capitol building. In that same breath, Roman engineering and construction left its mark on the world. The Romans changed the Western world by spreading their innovations in engineering throughout the empire. They built long-lasting roads that helped to increase trade and also helped their armies to quickly move about the empire. Many of these roads are still used today. The Romans were also known for their public projects. They built aqueducts to bring water into the cities for all to use. They also built public buildings like bathhouses. To build many of these projects, the Romans perfected the art of concrete. Roman concrete allowed them to build strong and durable buildings at a lower cost than stone. Lastly, we have Christianity as a legacy of the Roman Empire. The latter part of the Roman Empire had a great impact on religion in Europe through the spread of Christianity. Rome was the home of the Catholic Church, which would hold great influence over Europe for the next thousand years. Today, Christianity is the largest religion in the world. We can't talk about all the things that were left as a legacy to this modern world, but the ancient world as they are so many, some that we bet you did not even think of. For example, they created journalism, but not quite how we know it today. In around 131 BC, the Romans invented the first newspaper called the Acta Diurna, meaning the Daily Acts. These weren't papers at all, but rather pieces of metal or stone that were available in public spaces for people to read. The Romans were also responsible for creating the Julian calendar, which was split into 12 months. Like the calendar that we use today, it is based on the movement of the earth around the sun and the months were named after Roman gods and rulers. The Romans also began the practice of taking a census to keep track of everybody who was living in the Roman Empire. Today in the UK, a census is held every 10 years. Add to that list, the Roman number system, Roman numerals are still used today in many forms Forms all across the globe. It's just so many things. So now the next time you see memes like this, realize where it comes from. It comes from one of the most powerful, one of the most dominant, one of the most legendary empires in the world, the Roman Empire.